Man, it feels like it took us a long time to get just to the primary. Well, some of you weren't even paying attention, so I guess that doesn't resonate with you. We'll talk about it. Well, the host is punchy, uh, as most media people are the day after a primary. Uh, we're not as punchy as the candidates, though, who I'm sure are completely exhausted. Thank you for tuning in to My State of Mind. I am Dan York. Uh, tonight, tonight, uh, the rundown will be kind of the part of the whole show, as we do from time to time when we have our really smart people on. Ted Nisi is going to join me here momentarily. Program note, Buddy Cianci, you may have heard of him, is my guest for tomorrow night here on the show. So uh, spread the word on that, only because I'm sure a lot of folks are wondering about the dynamic of two guys who are on the radio at the same place who have known each other for a long time and who are gonna have a pretty honest conversation about, about this race coming up tomorrow night here on My State of Mind. So with the primary now completed and the qualifying round to the general election uh, having established who's in and who's out. Let us go to the rundown and just tell you about the subject matter this evening. Um, I thought the unaffiliated voters really dictated the pace in both the Democratic and Republican races, one for and one against, and we'll talk with Ted about that. This was the upset of the evening, and old Ralph Mollis has got to find a real job now. Uh, Frank Caprio set a new world record for conceding about um, one minute after, after the polls were closed. Uh, We'll talk about it. Uh, yeah, if not for the two of them together, this would not have happened. The media has lost its mind when it comes to Buddy CNC and all sorts of other stuff if we can get to it because there were a lot of races, right? Lots of stuff. A lot. Do you go to bed late? late 4 a.m. 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. You look pretty good. I always do. do Makeup, my makeup? friend. You know yeah. that. <laughs> Uh, before I get into specifics, what is your one takeaway from the evening? Disagree with you on the biggest upset. Mine is Nellie Gorbea upsetting Guillaume de Ramel. All right, well, then get off the show. Uh, let's, uh, you, don't, you disagree with me in 30 seconds? You're going to you just pick a fight early? You, you like to fight. You no, saw me Well, listen, um, they're both upsets. They are. She's, an, she's an, well, you know what? I don't know. This is the good pundit stuff. She is the former deputy of the office. So it's not like she's some out of the blue. She didn't have the dough that Day Ramel did. Not she had. She didn't have the dough. She had almost no endorsements. He had locked up the unions and the institutional party. He had Mattiello. He had the party endorsement. People had given her up for dead weeks ago, and uh, and I, I had no expectation she would win last night. I really, I really didn't. I was Joe Fleming and I sitting in the studio trying to figure out whether to call the race or like, is this happening? You know, ninety-two percent. We don't usually wait much longer than that to call the race. We're like, let's watch a little bit further. Really, uh, really striking. I think. All right. Well, you'll agree with me that Dan McKee was an upset, though. Absolutely. I think um, I would. I was giving McKee higher odds, still an upset, than Nelly Gorbea going into last night. I thought he closed relatively well in that campaign, got some attention. Ralph Mollis just getting beaten up on 38 Studios. Uh, uh, hold your thought, because yep. we'll, we'll dig in a little bit more on that. So let's go to the graphics and the numbers so that you can take a real good look at uh, how it really turned out. Ramondo, uh, as it happens often, pulls out in the end and has more breathing room than people pollably would have expected. Um, and Angel Tavares and Clay Pell actually sit in right there exactly where the polling data for Brojo and WPRI put them. So. That shows you the polling data was phenomenally accurate, that she just grabbed the momentum of what I consider to be the unaffiliated voter thrust into this race, yes? Absolutely, I definitely agree with you on this one, Dan. I think, uh, I think there, was, there was some kind of anti-incumbent, uh, anti-insider kind of thing going on last night. You could see it all through the results. Gina Raimondo really walking away with it despite um, all the unions really being against her and her not being necessarily a traditional Democrat. Dan McKee, you just pointed out, pulling it off against Ralph Mollis. Guillaume de Ramel losing to Nelly Gorbea. Um, and Frank Caprio, obviously, losing to Seth Magazine. Or even David Cicilline, a third of the voters voted against him against the no-name candidate. So I think this is part of it. I think Gina Raimondo brought a lot of voters out who really wanted something very different from sort of the establishment Democratic Party in Rhode Island. And I think in the end, she closed very well. And then she had so much more money. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Labor took a pistol and went... <laughs> with it by creating the Clay Pell factor. Now, it's chicken or the egg. If you talk to the union guys, they'll say, oh, no, Clay Pell came to us. Whatever, uh, as the kids say, whatever. Right. Uh, Tavares and Pell represented a fractionalized labor movement that more or less 
if it wasn't fractionalized, would have taken Gina Raimondo out. In other words, if one of those candidates had run, she had a chance of losing. Not guaranteed, but, right? Yeah, I mean, so, so striking me this morning, every candidate for statewide office endorsed by Council 94, the biggest state workers union, lost last night. They endorsed Tavares, Mollis, Caprio, Faye Ramel. Um, yeah, I think, but I think the funny thing is, the longer this has gone on, labor can count just as well as anybody. And I think the fact that the teachers unions went with Clay Powell, even seeing in the polling for the last few months that he could take enough of the vote to help let Angel Tavares lose to Gina Armando, tells me they had serious, serious problems with Angel Tavares, too. They did not see him as some, uh, some savior. Well, when he fired the teachers, fired the it teachers, was the big Bellwether. ed reform guy. Um, and just, you know, it's personality clashes, too, at the top with all these folks. Well, I guess what? The, the teachers' unions are going to have to figure out that the general public has a different thought about this whole thing, uh, as evidenced by McKee's victory, in part. Uh, we'll talk about that. So uh, Gina is positioned well for the general election, no doubt, right? Let's take a look at the Republican uh, numbers here, if we can. Uh, Alan Fung, with what is close to landslide numbers, uh, the 55-45 begins the conversation about landslide. Interestingly enough, I think... My thought is is that the uh, uh, unaffiliated voters swing into the Democratic primary hurt Ken Block. He needed a whole lot more folks who were not Republican registered to come in and help him with that race, right? I, I was never sure of that, only because I felt like Ken Block was actually running a campaign that should have really appealed to base Republican voters. Fiscally conservative, uh, railing against the General Assembly and the Democrats who are in charge up there. Things that should have really appealed to those voters. I know his party affiliation was an issue there, but uh, I still think, you know, a lot of people had left Alan Fung for dead in the last couple of weeks because of all his campaign gaffes and things. But in the end, you know, they ran a base strategy, ran up a score in Cranston, and, and he won. And this is what he says. Uh, can, we, can we play that, Laura? The, the Alan Fung? Yeah. I know that the voters have been resonating with the message of fiscal reform, fiscal discipline, and fiscal accountability that we've had in Cranston that we'll certainly, we will certainly take to uh, the State House. Yeah, you know, I will tell you that uh, you know, congratulations to Alan. You know, I've always considered him to be a pretty decent guy, but his campaign is full of uh, thuggish behavior, and they lead the league. They'd be like the Oakland Raiders of the NFL, right? The highest penalized uh, crew. They run a lot of uh, dirty work on, on the ground, and uh, I'm not so sure that's going to be the kind of uh, class uh, effort that he's going to need in a general election. We'll see. Uh, I Another do risk for him, I think, is that you know, if you look at the, the, the win last night, Gina Raimondo at this time is winning 36 of 39 cities and towns. She built support across Rhode Island and throughout the state. Mm. Alan Fung won about, I think he won about 20 or 22 of the cities and towns, and with very small vote totals because it's a Republican primary. So she's already started to build what she needed for the fall. But he's, you know, he's got a significant foothold in Cranston despite the police controversies that were there, and he did well in the city of Providence. And I think that if labor makes a deal with him, he becomes more formidable. Now, what does he have to soul sell in order to be able to get that support? Who knows? But they they still see her as kryptonite to Superman, right? So she's not a lock yet. The next two or three weeks, and your reporting will yeah. be interesting, because I'm counting on you to be able to, and, and Dan McGowan and Ted, I mean, and Timmy and all those guys, to, to, all, all three of you guys, to go find out where this stuff mm -hmm. is going to be in the next two or three weeks. I think in a month we'll know if Ellen Funk can make it. Mm -hmm or has a shot at making it. Yeah, I think, think Labor has some tough conversation. Of, like I said, Council 94 losing every race they endorsed them, even these low-profile down-ballot ones. I mean, they really picked the wrong horse and couldn't pull them but over Council 94 finish. and NEAAFT, while they are in the Labor umbrella, are two different animals. Yep. We'll see where the width and breadth of the NEA and AFT go. Now, the thing is, Alan Fung said in our uh, debate uh, just last week that he was open to a right-to-work law in Rhode Island, which is anathema. Big problem. Big problem. I was a little surprised he... He didn't find a way to rule that out, though I understand it's popular with Republican primary voters because it was clear, it's been clear for months, I agree with you, that labor was interested in Fung. It's the kind of thing that Alan Fung will have no problem doing this. Oh, I know I said it, but uh, oh, I was only kidding. Or, oh, I said it, I thought I was just going to consider it. Uh, I know I said it, but uh, believe me, that's the kind of thing that will wash in this state real fast. Labor can also stay it. home. Just uh, shrug and give up. They don't like to say that. Because they much. might want to... Uh, to, to keep hold their fire on the sidelines. And by the way, Gina Raimondo is a pragmatist. I'm sure her people are thinking today about what she could do, not to win over the whole labor movement, but to try to make some inroads in there. Uh, maybe she sells her soul too. Maybe they both try it. Oh, uh, let's not forget she sold a little bit of her soul on the pension negotiation. I mean, she did not, she would say, oh, I've only gave up 5% of the deal uh, in the midst of the arbitration or the court battle, rather, on pension. Um, there's room for her to do a little soul selling. 
Yeah. Which is just, <laughs> is what you got to do to get to the top, I yeah. guess. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about some of the other races, and then we'll really fight over what's the biggest upset they will. I'm going to I'm running for governor to be the jobs governor to turn this economy around. We kept it positive. We focused on my experience and ability to do that, and I think that resonated. This environment, you got to get close in. Altoids. <laughs> you hope so, You know, right? Tim doing good work. <laughs> yeah, some good coverage last night. Uh, she's odds on. If you told me to put a bet down, she'd be odds on. But who knows how this whole thing is going to go. Lieutenant Governor's race, very interesting. Now, Ted would suggest to you that Nellie Gorbea's upset in the Secretary of State race is bigger than this one. doesn't matter. Arguing about it is silly, it's, but it's fun. It's the kind of stuff you stay up all night when you're a sports fan or a political wonk. Uh, Dan McKee... Uh, with 43-36, the original poll. Did we have the polling data? Didn't we have that originally? We yeah. did. They were at the polling data. Thank you, Laura. Uh, he was down 10 with 50%. I don't know. And then you see the numbers and how they came out. And so uh, here was Dan McKee last night. And this is via my iPhone. How about this? This is not eyewitness news. This is Dan York whipping out his iPhone. And I caught a little bit of his little celebration there. My son, Matthew, yeah. who came up with the stand with Dan theme. And we are going to continue that right through November, you stand with me. Yes. You stand with me. And the state of Rhode Island stood with us tonight. And I will stand with you as your lieutenant governor in November. Ralph Mollis uh, bites the dust here. Tough couple of weeks, 38 studios. Tough couple months. Months, in a lot of ways yeah. For him. yeah. I mean, you know, he. Ralph Mollis, uh, you know, in some ways, it looks like this election was sealed when he decided not to pursue anything about 38 studios when it was actually happening. I mean, I have to. And I know maybe I'm biased because Tim and I worked so hard on that story about him and the lobbying, but I think, you know, it made him look ineffectual in his job. It's not like he had a big resume of things he'd done as and Secretary of State. And then he gets called out as using the courts a for political week purposes. before the primary, yeah. too. A terrible headlines. Terrible headlines. At the same time, Dan McKee really worked hard on the ground. He had some outside PAC money that certainly helped him while he was getting, I think, screwed at the Board of Elections for his financing. Yeah, but he, they went and they, they, they did a, tra a check trade where he actually had the money anyway in, in the last part of the election. Listen, a lot of people suggest lieutenant governor's race is not worth talking about because it's a nothing position. He wants to entrepreneurialize it. Full disclosure, he's a buddy of mine. He's my mayor. Um, but I think he's one of the more conscientious public officials that we have out there. And he thinks he can make an effort on education and, and be a municipal government guy, liaison. Who knows? This could be one where I could see labor taking a closer look at the Republican, even maybe then with Funk. Kathy Taylor on the Republican side, she's right. a good candidate, and uh, I don't think she's said anything nearly as uh, problematic as Fung's right to work comments there. And the I teachers, you, you know how the teachers union feel yeah, about that. You're right. This rate, they, they spent 80 grand in the last couple of days with a, with a mail dump, anything but anybody but McKee. So they didn't disclose on it who was paying for it. Right. They're not done. And uh, Catherine Taylor is a, is a blue chip candidate, but I think had, a, had, had more going for her against Ralph Mollis, where she almost clipped him last time in the Secretary of State's race than she does against... Uh, Dan McKee doesn't have the we don't like him baggage other than the union, teacher unions getting after him. So, I agree with you. Um, so that ought, to be, that ought to be interesting coming in. And then, of course, you go to the treasurer's race, and we've got a full screen on that data. That was over before the evening started, but we knew that. It, I think, can we, our, Lark, can we play this ad? This is a piece of Frank's uh, comeback ad, which was, I think, the most embarrassing television ad I've seen in a long time in political advertising. It was just pathetic. Can we run it? In life, you take some hits, and sometimes you get knocked down. It's happened to me. But the true test we face in life is when you get knocked down, do you pick yourself up and make a comeback? Well, I'm making a comeback run for treasurer because I know we can do better in Rhode Island. And over the course of the ad, he gets angrier looking and angrier looking. It was a menacing ad. And by the way, Frank, nobody's voting for you because we want you to make a comeback. They vote for you because they want to know what you can do for them. I never, um, I never fully understood Frank Caprio's, what was really driving his comeback, right? When his father. You know, I've wondered that, too. His father's always had high ambitions for Frank. Frank's been an overachiever all his life, Harvard and everything else. I think uh, Frank, you know, even initially coming out and not knowing what party he would run in. I mean, I, you almost appreciate the honesty, but the flip side is, in politics, you don't want to tell a party for a year. You're considering other, other dates. And then the brother. And then the brother. The, brother, the brother, David really, Caprio, with yeah. the Beach Concession And Seth contract. Magaziner, I know there's debate over this. I think he was a stronger candidate. People thought he might be another Clay Pell. I think he was much more poised than Clay Pell, despite his age. 
uh, Seth Magaziner, -er, and I think he did a good job and then took advantage. So much of politics is taking advantage of the opening, and mm -hmm. he sure did. I don't think, uh, Frank Caprio is always, uh, you know, always had a, a, a good relationship with him. I think he's a decent guy. He needs to take a break and refigure this whole thing out. I mean, this is, um, I hate to see him get thumped like that, and I hate to offer that kind of commentary, but you got to figure out. You just can't look like the spoiled brat that needs to have, you know, the, the, whose, whose castle has been invaded. Before you we move on, I just say, I do think Ernie Almonte, the independent, will, will be a factor in the fall. Formidable. Mm -hmm. I think Ernie, Ernie has a real chance. By the way, I would say, I would suggest that Ernie Almonte is the most qualified candidate for any position in this general election, meaning he, he the treasurer, is as qualified or better than any candidate seeking an office. He's that smart, but will he have the money? Will he have, you know, uh, will he be able to get traction? Mm -hmm. Who knows? You think he will? We'll wait for, the, we'll wait for the Fleming poll uh, the, exactly. uh, on that. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about the Providence Mayor's race, which is its own separate theater. Stay with us. So moving down uh, with Ted Nisi talking about last night's primary results, uh, the Providence Mayor election uh, is very, very interesting. We have that data. So Jorge Alorza upsets Michael Solomon, of course, with the help of uh, Brett Smiley, who actually did uh, remain on the ballot and had like 600 votes. And uh, that combo was enough to tip over Michael Solomon. It was interesting watching the Channel 12 coverage last night because you actually had reporters in, in, in the Solomon headquarters thinking that's the winning place, and they had to go, uh-oh, guess what? we got to get out of here. We scrambled. We admit it, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it's good yeah. theater. Got him going. You yeah. Got, you got to mean, react. It, came, it was clear. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dan McGowan was actually downstairs crunching the numbers before I came up with you, and he, he had just figured out Michael Solomon actually won the South Side. Very surprising to people, considering Jorge Lorza was a, the Latino candidate and the Hispanic population is so big there. But he just got creamed on the East Side, Michael Solomon. I think there were a lot of people who voted for Lorza and Raimundo. Some pieces of uh, sound from last night between those two guys. The goal is to win in November, and we're going to unify the Democratic base to make sure we don't just win in September, but we take this to victory in November as well. So while we wished for a different outcome, I can honestly say I gave it my best, and we left it all on the field. Well, you know, you always got to get the athletic metaphors there. Uh, the truth of the matter is that Michael Solomon was not a very dynamic candidate. So Jorge Alorza presents a little bit different uh, challenge to Buddy Cianci. And Laura, one. if you could put that just that theme up for this conversation on Cianci, because this one has thrown up my wazoo sideways last night watching coverage on, frankly, all three television stations, if I'm going to be fair and candid. And that is that, well, look, he's the elephant in the room. He's also the story in the mayoral race, no doubt about that. And he has to be included in the coverage. But this, this kind of... Uh, you know, semi-orgasmic journalistic reaction to even he having anything to say last night. Uh, last I checked, he didn't win anything last night. He didn't win a primary. Um, is he part of the story? Of course. But I think uh, the media needs to calm it down a little bit when it comes to Buddy CNC and take a little bit more of a measured approach. It's almost like we're trying to create a story where a story already exists. I don't disagree at all. I think it's very important for a, a mind shift to happen among the reporters in this market that Buddy Cianci is now just another candidate for political office. He's not just a, he's not just a figure of fun. He's not just a, pro, a Rhode Island mascot. He is a candidate for office with a long and uh, interesting record that needs to be scrutinized. I mean, Tim White did something about his pension deal the night after he announced. I mean, that's the kind of stories people need to be doing just as much as, oh, but he's talking about marinara and, and, sauce. And, you know, I've known about this pension deal for a while. He doesn't have to work very much in order to be able to get a full pension. And don't tell me this. All, you, you're talking about pension. I'm talking about the money he gave away by signing a deal to oh, bankrupt the system. Well, by the way, well, well you know what, then? I may, I may have gotten into something that Buddy and I will talk about tomorrow <laughs> night, uh, and that would be his pension. Stay tuned for that. When... Uh, uh, when he's challenged, though, by the likes of Sean Daly about his felon uh, the status, I mean, he just gives it back and actually motivates him. Watch this video from last night. Prediction in November. Who wins? I win. Uh, I don't have any doubt about that. I'll win the election because a number twice one convicted felon wins oh, an election. Oh, stop with that! You know something? You know, I thought you were supposed to be a newsbreaker. Well, what is so new about that? It's you, not you, new. You it's win. just a fact. It is an fact, immutable and, and, fact. And, and so is it a fact that we're talking more about the future of the city. You know what? I go around this city as you have not, and I talk to people. You know what they want to know? When are we going to have safe streets? When are we going to have an economy that puts people back to work? As far as I'm concerned, I'm moving forward. The law says I can run. I paid my price, and I'm going to be mayor of the city of Providence as I was before when we made this city really click. 
Let me tell you, there are times when he looks really old in 73, and there are times when he looks 73 on, going on 53. Bizarrely angry, though. Hmm. The man went to jail for running City Hall as a criminal enterprise. He should not be that hostile to a question about it. I just, I'm very surprised Unless, he's well, not been trained well hey, enough well, on that. Well, you know what? I would disagree with you, to be, to be honest with you. I mean, how many times you got to be asked the same damn question? The constituents know it. They get it. They factored it in. It's not a mystery. So if he gets angry about being asked the same damn question while he wants to talk about the future, I think that's a tack he ought to take. The future of putting him back in City Hall when he went to jail over it. Two different consultations here. Are you editorializing? I'm not. I'm yes, you saying. are. No. Yes. No. A uh, couple other things that moved you last night. You thought that, that Matt Fecto's 37% against David Cicilline. I don't know if you've got that, Laura, if you can pull that out of the... Uh, graphics wazoo uh, in, long story in, in short, a moment. Long story short, a third of the primary electorate voted against renominating David Cicilline for Congress. I mean, that's that's pretty surprising. He's a he's a sitting incumbent congressman. I mean, uh, Jack Reed, you'd expect to get like ninety-five. He's the only candidate that everybody votes for that n nobody likes. That's number one. And the other thing is, you could fart and get thirty-five percent against an incumbent. So I don't know why that's surprising to you. I. I Fair enough. I disagree. I just think it shows that there's a significant anti cicilline sentiment in there that I was surprised by. Thanks for your analysis. <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? Your state of mind next. <laughs> MeyerITV.com. Did I just come up? There I am. Okay, we're good. You know how to get in touch with us. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so the other day, I'm, uh, I'm in Indian Point Park at, at this festival, and I see this picture. Do we have this picture? There's the Buddy Van. We talked about this, and here's an email response to it, or a Facebook post. Somebody says the following. Uh, Greg says, you should have loudspeakers on top to announce that he's the anti-corruption candidate. Yes, and there should be like Sean Daly there to ask another question. I gotta go. We'll see Buddy tomorrow and you on the radio. Buddy's on the TV tomorrow. I'll see you on the radio at noon. Goodbye. Bye.